So today we're going to talk about the carbon cycle. A lot of times when we talk about the carbon cycle, we use a cartoon such as this, where it shows arrows depicting uh, which way carbon is moving through the hydrosphere, atmosphere, and the biosphere. But really, we're, we're not getting the full picture. And so that's where the, the box models that we covered in the last lecture will come into play. The box model will be able to put this process on the appropriate time scale. And in doing so, it will help us truly understand how carbon is moving and what we are doing today in terms of the burning of fossil fuels, how that's going to affect the earth for millennia. And so the carbon cycle, it's actually driven by the sun. It's driven by photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, you can think of it as a pump which continues to take the carbon dioxide and turn it into biomass. And it's essentially a redox reaction where you're taking CO2, a very stable compound, and you're turning it into reduced carbon, which then reacts with other elements. And so not only does photosynthesis drive the carbon cycle, but it also drives geochemical cycles of other redox active elements, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and even iron. So a lot of these geochemical cycles are tied together. So with respect to the carbon cycle, we will look over uh, human impact on this cycle. We are disturbing this cycle. It is no longer in a steady state as it was for hundreds of thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution. And what we'll find is that due to human activities, we've increased the CO2 concentration and the methane concentration in the atmosphere, which is leading to global warming. And perhaps even more detrimental is most, or I should say much of the CO2, a third of the CO2 actually, that humans have produced during the Industrial Revolution has made it into our oceans, which is causing ocean acidification. So we'll, we'll touch on these topics more throughout the semester. So last, uh, I wanna remind you that the carbon cycle doesn't just involve organic carbon. That's what we think about a lot uh, when we think about the carbon cycle, things like biomass, fossil fuels. But in actuality, most of the carbon on Earth is inorganic. It's locked away in minerals as carbonate and even in the ocean. It's dissolved in the oceans as carbonate ion. So here's our box model, <clears throat> and I would like you all to hopefully get a printout of this or have a separate slide of the carbon cycle box model that you can refer to. So I guess we should start with the atmosphere. So this box model is actually fairly old, but I continue to use it because of all the information that's on it. So some of these numbers have definitely changed, uh, especially the atmosphere. This box model is actually, it's close to, probably the information on here is close to 40 years old. So we can imagine if they were estimating an annual increase of three times 10 to the 15 grams of carbon per year in the reservoir since then, that that number is probably closer to say 900 or maybe even a thousand um, times 10 to the 15. But nonetheless, the information on here is still useful. So with most of this carbon in the atmosphere as CO2, 
we do see an exchange with the hydrosphere. So this dotted line here is the hydrosphere. It contains fresh water, ocean surface water, which we separate from the deep water. And so we not only have fluxes in and out of the hydrosphere, but they also came up with fluxes within the hydrosphere, within different types of water. But when you look at the flux going out and in for carbon, we see that there's more carbon going into the ocean than what's going out. And it's in the form of CO2. So over here, we see the interaction of the atmosphere with the biosphere. And the biosphere is living things such as biota, but also uh, organic material in the soil, in bogs, things like that. So decaying um, organic matter. And what we also see is, you know, some of these are kind of ill-defined and that's okay. These are back of the envelope calculations. These are rough estimates. And given that this information is decades old, it could be that scientists have um, consolidated and um, learned more about these fluxes so that they're more uh, solid numbers. We also have some fluxes to and from the lithosphere. So the lithosphere is the continent itself. And so the drilling of fo for fossil fuels going up is a uh, five times 10 to the 15. And again, uh, that number is much higher today. Weathering, and we also have in the end, uh, burying of the carbon back into the ocean sediments. And that's a part of the cycle. For our purposes, we are going to kind of not think much about the, the lithosphere, mainly because the fluxes are very small. They're very small. And if we include the lithosphere, we end up with a very, very, very long process. So we are going to stay within this top range and see how dynamic these um, processes are in terms of exchange. And so with that box model to the side, we can look at the inventories, look at the fluxes, and calculate the mean residence time that carbon stays in each of the um, reservoirs. And so, again, I'm going to stay above the lithosphere. I'm going to just be in the biosphere and the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. And so when I do that, what I see is that on average, uh, CO2 spends about four years in the atmosphere. And currently, their estimates a little longer than that due to a larger um, inventory. But, you know, four years, seven years, it's that's how long CO2 stays in the atmosphere. The biosphere, if I take all the inventories and I took the, I believe I took the, the outs, all the fluxes out, you can do the ins or the outs and you'll get about the same answer. I took the outs, I divided the invent, all the inventory by the outs and I got 23 years. Now, does that number seem reasonable? Well, if we're talking about the biosphere, mostly living things or even just uh, organic matter that is slowly decomposing, I think 20 years is a pretty reasonable estimate of how long 
that carbon stays in the biosphere. If you think about living things, some things live only for weeks, but other things like redwood trees live thousands of years. But on average, we're talking about a 20 year residence time. The surface oceans, uh, carbon stays in the surface oceans for about five and a half years. So here are the inventories of the inorganic, organic, things like that. And I divided by the fluxes, either in or out. I believe these are all out fluxes from the surface ocean. And we'll talk very soon about the difference between the surface water and the deep water. The deep water is a huge reservoir for organic and inorganic carbon. And we divide by the flux, we get a residence time of 940 years. So when the carbon reaches the deep ocean, on average, it stays there quite a long time. And so that reservoir plays a very important part to the entire cycle. So here's the great ocean conveyor belt. So it is a system of different currents that allow water to move and distribute to different parts of the many oceans. And in doing so, it also transfers heat to the northern and southern latitudes from the equator. This allows for places like Europe to have a moderate climate, even though they rest at a fairly high latitude. So usually when we tell this story, we start in the Caribbean. We start in the Caribbean because this water is very warm and very salty. And so this water heads north. And as it heads north, it starts to cool. And when salty water cools, it becomes very dense. Cold water is denser than warm water, and saltier water is denser than fresh water. So as this warm Gulf Stream moves north, up by Iceland, up by Greenland, it gets cold enough and dense enough, it sinks and it sinks to the deep water. It sinks to the very bottom of the ocean. 
And from there, that cold water begins to move south along the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and it heads around the bottom of Africa into the Indian Ocean. We also have another place here in the Waddell Sea where warm water from the Pacific and from the Southern Ocean also becomes cold and dense and sinks and it sinks right here. So these waters then again move into the Indian Ocean and they move into the Pacific Ocean in the deep water. And that process to get from Iceland all the way to our coast over in Humboldt, it takes 2,000 years for that water to travel along the bottom of the ocean. And it does so again in the deep ocean. At some point though, it will resurface and then travel along the surface back to the Atlantic Ocean and back to the Caribbean. And that would complete the cycle. So, to complete the entire cycle, it takes 4,000 years, 2,000 of that in the deep ocean. And so, in order to understand we, how this works and why we get 1,000 years for a mean residence time, but 2,000 years to complete the cycle, we have to understand upwelling. Upwelling is the process by which the deep water comes back up to the surface. And so when we look at the earth, we're spinning. And because we're spinning and we have smaller distance at the northern latitudes compared to more distance near the equator, what happens to circulation is it starts to bend. It starts to bend such that in the northern hemisphere, we see that north wind kind of deflects to the right. Everything kind of takes a right hand turn due to this Coriolis effect. And so because of that, what I've drawn here is the west coast of the United States and Mexico. Here's Baja, California. And so what we typically get in the spring and summertime are these north winds. And these north winds are very strong. And actually Cape Mendocino, right in our backyard, has the highest upwelling index in North America. We have the the best winds of any place on uh, the West Coast. And because of that, these north winds blow towards the south, but what that does is causes a deflection to the right. And so as it pushes on the surface water of the ocean, what occurs is that surface water starts to head offshore. It heads offshore. We call this Ekman transport. It goes offshore and in doing so the deep water from below comes up and replaces it. This is what's responsible for our cold water along our coast. And so in that process of upwelling that CO2 that and carbonate that's been in the deep water for 2,000 years finally comes up along our coast and is now back in the surface waters where it can exchange with the atmosphere or perhaps even get incorporated into phytoplankton and be a part of the biosphere again. And so this process of upwelling, it happens on the west coast of continents. So it happens on the west coast of Africa, 
the Arabian Sea, things like, uh, yeah, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, even Peru, and of course, our coast here. And so here's a diagram uh, showing this process of upwelling. The winds coming from the north, we get Ekman transport, the water moving offshore, and that deep water that's cold, full of nutrients, goes into the surface water. Remember, the surface water is also where we have sunlight, so we get algal blooms, diatoms bloom, and all that nutrients comes up from those deep waters. I just wanted to show you a satellite image of what upwelling looks like. Here's the Gulf of the Farallons. We talked about that on the first day, right outside of San Francisco Bay. But those north winds along Point Arena cause the water as you see in these kind of jets, these are all little eddies and jets heading offshore. And in doing so, the deep water comes up and fills in this area. It's full of nutrients. And so what we see in red is actually chlorophyll. It is showing how uh, diatoms are taking advantage of this nutrients coming from the deep water and we're getting an explosion of uh, productivity, which then uh, continues up the food chain. And so that was, that was a lot of talk, but nonetheless, it's very important for us to realize that uh, the ocean is a very important part of the carbon cycle. And so we need to factor in ocean circulation when considering the time scale of the carbon cycle. And so to can get complete turnover, of the carbon cycle, it's 2,000 years. And so what does that mean? Well, what that means is, say, say I died today, and they took me to the crematory, and they turned my body into ashes. Well, the ashes, that's all my minerals, right? All the carbon in my body would have been combusted and out the chimney into the atmosphere. All my carbon is now in the atmosphere. But from there, my carbon would then distribute and start being taken up by the plants. It will start to dissolve into the surface waters of the oceans. It would start to even head into the deep ocean. And what this number means to me, in 2000 years, I could say that my carbon that was recycled after my death, my carbon after 2000 years is distributed evenly over the face of the earth. And I find that to be a very beautiful thing that my carbon that I use has now been distributed. And you could say that at, after 2000 years, I, the carbon that was once in me is now in everything on earth to a fraction. And that also goes to say that the carbon in me, I possess carbon that was a part of everything that came before me as well.